Amen and amen. amen. The simple translation of our song is that Jesus spoke and then the wind or the sea calmed. And that is where we are starting from today. A beautiful gospel reading that has been presented to us. And Jesus was traveling with the apostles on the sea. And he dozed off and suddenly the wave or the storm came. What did the apostles did? What did they do? Sorry. They did not just allow the storm to continue. And they didn't allow Jesus to continue to sleep. They have to do something. My dear brothers and sisters, there was this, a story about those who, was, who were traveling on a sea. And it happened that their ship started to experience storms. And people were running helter-skelter. They were trying to see how they steady themselves in the ship so that they will not fall out. As the storm was breaking deep and strong, there was a, a girl that was among them. And as every other person was scampering for safety, the girl didn't send anybody. He didn't actually move. She continued to stay where she was. And the man pulled him and said, are you not seeing that every other person is running? Can't you feel the storm? Of course, there is no way you have the availability of storm and everywhere will not be shaking. And then at that point, the girl responded to the man, yes, I know I can see the storm, but I relax because I don't believe that the storm will actually destroy me because... My father is over there. My father is the captain of the ship. If there is a serious danger, my father will first and foremost come to rescue me. My dear brothers and sisters, Igbo people will tell you, no yen near on any way at the Jokomo, that the one that the father is in heaven can never go to hellfire. Well, I'm not here to ascertain the truthfulness of this Igbo phrase. But from the way it sounded, we know that yes, the father can do everything within his possible best in order to see that this child is saved. And that is where we read in the Bible, Luke chapter 11 verse 4, our father in heaven. There cannot be two fathers in heaven. It's only one father that is in heaven. And Isaiah 66 verse 1 says, that the father that is in heaven has heaven as his throne. But as he stays in the heaven, and heaven is his throne, he doesn't just stay there. But from the heaven that he stays, that the earth is his footstool. That means that the father that is in heaven oversees those on earth. You and I are the children of the father. We have God as our father. And the God that we have as our father Never just keep quiet in midst of the great storm of our life. Like the little girl in the ship, every other person was looking for a way out. But she knew that she's covered because she's under the territory and custody of the father. No wonder the Bible says in Psalm 103 verse 13 that as we have the earthly father, the heavenly father pities us. Where will the sympathy come from? Where will the pity come from, if not from the Father? And that is why we come to read in the Bible that God has sent his only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not actually die, but we have eternal life. And as we go on with John chapter 3, verse 16, we actually know that Jesus was sent by the Father in order to be there for us. And as we know that, 
we come to know, as the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, that Jesus has come in order to destroy the power of Satan. As we have our Heavenly Father, there is no way the tidal wave and the strong storm will actually blow us bad. The Father sees everything and he knows what to do. Jesus has been sent by the Father. And as Jesus has been sent by the Father, Jesus can never allow us to be carried away or be broken by the storm. And no wonder we come to hear today in the gospel reading how Jesus was called upon and he, and he, 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 he moved into action. There is a point I want to make here. There is no way we call upon God and God will not answer us. The Bible told us today in Mark chapter 4 that Jesus was sleeping. I will still come later to that. Can Jesus sleep? Can our God sleep? I don't think that God can sleep. God is spirit according to John chapter 4 verse 24. And only in spirit and in truth that we will serve him. Of course, as God is spirit, we know even if he has an eyes, it's not the kind of physical eyes that you and I have. Even if God has eyes, the eyes that God has is a spiritual eyes. And that is why I believe that if God is spirit and has a spiritual eyes, there is no way he can actually close his eyes and say he's sleeping. Yes, they saw Jesus and they said that he was sleeping. But in actual sense, if Jesus was actually sleeping, as they called upon him, he could not have answered. You know what happens when somebody is dozing off and you try to touch the person to wake the person. The person wakes, but you know that the person will still be feeling asleep. And as the Igbo people would say, Nanyola ne monyawa. At times, you see, you wake somebody. You just wake somebody. But because the person is not totally awake, that the person is still struggling with the sleep, you just wake the person. You see the person talking out of sense. There are some people also, you just wake them. As you just wake them like that, they start walking up and down. They don't know where they are going. Before you can say, Jack, some of them are falling wherever they are. Even if potter potter mud is there, they will sleep off again. Because annual and amen, they are still feeling asleep. But this time around, as they called Jesus, he was able to respond. Before I go into the way he responded, it's good for us actually to establish here that God can never sleep. The Bible says in Psalm 121 verse 4, that the protector of Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. And that's why also we come to hear from the Bible that even while we sleep ourselves, that God provides for us. If God is not at an alert, according to Psalm 127 verse 2, he cannot be readily available to provide for us. Even as we go to sleep, God does not go to sleep. I want you to touch your neighbor on your right and say, my God does not sleep. And then touch the one on your left and say, neither does he slumber. The truth of the matter is that God does not close eyes. If God closes eyes, this world will collapse immediately. And that is where we come to know it. That even as we close our eyes and we sleep, our God can never sleep. As the Bible says, that even as we sleep, he provides for us. If God sleeps, we cannot have anything to eat. If God sleeps, we will not be able to do anything. If our God sleeps, we cannot be able to forge ahead. And that is why as we are saying it, I tell somebody this morning, your God can never sleep. And let your God never sleep. In any way that you are experiencing the quietude and silence of God, I pray that your God will be at alert. In the mighty name of Jesus. Of course we know it. And that is what happened. If Jesus was actually sleeping, he could not have been able to respond immediately. Yet I see it that 
they, they thought that Jesus was sleeping. As Jesus was on the other couch, one side of the ship, closing his eyes. I believe that what was happening there, that Jesus was attending to the needs of others. And that is why also we are encouraged to know it. That even when we think that God is not around, even when we think that God is not close, wherever God is, he can respond to us in a minute. He can even respond to us in a second. God is not far from us. He is always near around us. He is actually a helper that is always there. Psalm 46 verse 2 says, Psalm 46 verse 1 says, that God is our refuge and our strength, a helper in time of need. And that is why I say to somebody that we need to do one thing. You must call upon him. Supposing that the apostles were experiencing the storm and they were not able to call upon him, I believe that the storm could have actually swallowed and killed them. But in the midst of storm, they decided to do one thing. And that is why one song, in, one song says in English that oh, when we go with the Lord Jesus in every battle, we are a winner. And that is what actually happens. As the apostles noticed that there was storm, they now knew that it was time for them to contact Jesus. How far, sister? How far, brother? When last have you contacted God? Many of us have not spoken to God. How do we actually contact God? How do we speak to God? The better way that we speak to God is by us trying to go to him in prayer. As the apostles turned to Jesus and called him, it's like they are actually reaching out to him. Whenever we pray, we reach out to God. And that is why it is good that in everything that we experience in our life, we must call on God. We must call on God in prayer. And there is no way we call on God that he does not answer. You can see this scenario now. They thought that Jesus was sleeping. Or even if Jesus was sleeping. But as they called him, Jesus gave them attention. Even when you think that you are alone, in your business, in your shop, in your family, even where you go for school or studies, you may think that you are alone. But whenever a problem comes, it's time for you to know that God is always with you. God is always with us. And then we come to here in the Bible, Jesus saying, Matthew 28, 20, I am with you till the end of time. It actually was proven today. They called Jesus, even when he was not with them, even when he did not know what was happening around them. But as they called him, he responded immediately. That is a proof that he is with us till the end of time. Brother or sister, Jesus is with you till the end of time. Problem will come, trouble will come, calamities will surround you. There will be predicaments in your life. But let that predicament and calamities not make you to shut up your mouth. In midst of everything that you are encountering, you must open your mouth. You must open your mouth in prayer. You must open your mouth to call God. There is no way you call on him that he will not take action. And that is where we come to hear that immediately they called on him and Jesus saw the storm. And the first thing Jesus did was to calm this wave. And then he rebuked the storm. I wouldn't know the problems of your life. There are many of us that are battling with problems of insecurity. Your life is being threatened. You are exposed to danger. Your life is in a serious and terrible jeopardy. There is no one to rescue you. You struggle on your own. The harder you struggle, the more hopeless you become. There is another person. You have done everything within your possible best. I met somebody recently who said he continued going to hospital and the test is the same. He changed the doctors. He changed the hospitals. He went even to specialist hospital and the test is still the same. And the test says that you are fertile. 
that in fact you're supposed to conceive one hand. But over the years, this person has not conceived. And then somebody comes to know it. There, there is storm in the person's life. She has tried to know what is wrong in her life. The more she makes effort to know, the more confused she becomes. If she is actually undergoing all the tests and scan, and everything is good and, and positive, but at the same time, she's not able to conceive. That means that the storm that is in her life is a storm that is a storm, a storm that has come to stay. But I want to tell somebody that one thing is obvious. The storm may actually be there. It doesn't matter how long the storm has been there. But what matters is that our God is capable. And one thing that I come to know is that these storms of our life make us to be frightened. They frighten us. They put us in fear. And that is why the disciples were asking Jesus, do you want us to be perished? And then one thing I know, as the gospel reading of today says, Mark chapter 4 verse 37, do you want us to, to perish? There is no way God can want you to perish. God created you for himself. The purpose of your life is actually God's own. There is no way God can see you dying and he leaves you there. Imagine as they ask Jesus, do you want us to perish? Will Jesus allow them to be perished? Jesus cannot allow them to perish. Jesus cannot allow them to die. And that is one thing somebody will know. Your God can never allow you to be destroyed. Your God can never allow you to perish. And that is where we have our faith. We must have faith in God. There is no way God will see you dying and he leaves you. And that is where we need to do one thing. Just as they asked him, do you want us to perish? And we know the answer. God can never allow you to perish. But I want you to also know one thing. For them to ask Jesus, do you want us to perish? That becoming human, they are human beings. They saw danger, but they knew that Jesus is capable. So for them to ask Jesus whether he wants them to perish is not out of place. My dear brothers and sisters, you remember in Matthew 27 verse 46 that even Jesus at a point asked God, do you want me to perish? When Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatani, my Lord and my God, why do you forsake him? Why have you forsaken me? Why do you forsake me? Yes, you know, God does not forsake, and God can never forsake his own son. We know by the end of the day that God did not forsake Jesus. For these people to go on to act, oh, do you want us to perish? And for Jesus to also say, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatani, we know that that is a reaction. When you are in midst of storm, when trouble surround you, you need to turn to God. Even if you are not addressing God properly, but what matters is that you are turning to God. Unfortunately, there are many of us that decide to turn to idol. There are many of us that decide to turn to deity. There are even many of us that decide to turn to men and women. One thing that we know is that if there is storm in our life, it's only God that can calm that storm. And that is why in that song I told you that, oh, when I walk with Lord Jesus, that I am a winner in every battle. When you continue to walk with deity or idol, you can never be a winner. Rather, you are a loser. When you decide to walk with any man or woman and not God, you can never be a winner, but rather you are a loser. Verse 8 or Psalm 118 says that it is better to place our trust in God than in princes and princesses. And somebody knows it. Men and women cannot do what God will do for you. Idols and shrine can never do what God will do for you. In fact, we know that for those who are choosing idols and deities, they increase their sorrow. And that is why, as the disciples turned to Jesus, and then, in midst of storm, and made him to respond to them, 
we should know that the solution we have is J. The solution we have is E. And the solution we have is S. The more solution we have is U. And the other solution we have is S. And that means that it's only Jesus that can actually solve our problems. Running to shrine will never solve our problem. Consulting men and women, even highly placed men and women, can never solve our problem. Umi Uku Jesus, doer of great things, what God does not allow, so shall it be for you and your family forever and ever.